Welcome to this narrated PowerPoint on the Elizabethans. As you'll see there, the Elizabethans makes up 20% of the total course. It is the second half of paper one, and paper one is one hour, 45 minutes. The first part of paper one is crime and punishment. There are five parts of the Elizabethans, as you can see in that top right hand corner. Just a quick look at the types of questions you'll get on the Elizabethans. So question 6a, remember the, the crime and punishment area has come first. So question 6a is will give you an interpretation, normally a picture, and you've got to explain what you see. It's really just the question of explaining what you see and putting it into context. Question 6b asks you for further ideas for further research. And really here, you've got to show your understanding of the image. What is missing from the image? What do you know further? You've got to show specific own knowledge to show what you do investigate further. It's normally a question of what is missing. How typical is the image? Does it tell you everything you need to know about the Elizabethans? Now, the Elizabethans itself is largely about interpretations. And on question seven, you'll get either two or three interpretations for you to look at. You've got to explain what the interpretations say, and you've got to explain the differences between the interpretations. And for the highest marks, you've got to explain why there are differences between the interpretations. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that the, the two general interpretations that we will get is, firstly, looking back upon the Elizabethan age, particularly after the turmoil of the Civil War that happened 50 years, 60 years later. Um, the Elizabethan period is seen as a golden age, a, a time of, of great things, a time of great government, a time of peace. However, if you get an interpretation from the time, um, from the 1580s, you know, Elizabeth really is getting old, and particularly into the 1590s, there is the continual threat from Spain, and there's domestic problems, there's the rise of the Puritans, and therefore what you'll find is that any interpretation from the time will be a more negative one. It's also worth bearing in mind that on an international stage, having defeated the Spanish and having increased trade around Europe, Elizabethan period is quite secure and quite positive. But on a domestic front, as Elizabeth lost power, as the Puritans rise, as the questions increase about who will inherit the throne with Elizabeth's lack of marriage and lack of children, domestically there is more turmoil. Also bear in mind, if you look at a child's history book, it's more likely to be positive and give you an overview rather than a, uh, a historian who will have done lots of research. Then we come on to questions eight or nine. Uh, you answer one of these. Uh, the questions here are all to do with a, a, a major question. Question eight here we can see is about the Catholics. Now always the key here is going to be looking at the key phrase that they use. So we've got dangerous and uncertain times is the key phrase. Well, it certainly was dangerous and uncertain times. Um, for Catholics in England around the 1580s, 1590s, but you'd have to be arguing that that was also linked to the threat from Philip of Spain and the Armada. If we look at question nine, Elizabeth, Elizabethan adventurers, did they increase English trade in all parts of the world? Well, that is clearly very debatable, that there were certainly some moves and there was, this is a great a, a time of great exploration and um, particularly in the Americas, and in the the east towards India and, and Indonesia, they certainly le left a legacy, a legacy of, of wanting to find out more, but it has to be said that most of that increased trade, um, particularly with the East Indies Company, um, occurred after the Elizabethan period. So this is just an, an idea of how complex those questions need to be, and they certainly need an awful lot of planning first. So Elizabeth's power, our first major topic area. So lots of the images that we've got of Elizabeth is a great use of glamour, uh, dances, plays, feasts. Uh, she was certainly um, someone who used her image to give her her great power. And her patronage was a way of maintaining this power. So no nobles would compete against each other to get access to Elizabeth and build their own network. If you could say you knew Elizabeth, then this certainly would count in your favour. The access to Elizabeth, if you could get anywhere near her, the, the privy chamber, um, then you would be faced with her ladies in waiting, who, from whom Elizabeth expected absolute loyalty. Um, we can see one example there of a finger being broken of one of the ladies in waiting who got married without permission. 
the closest group of advisors to Elizabeth were known as the Privy Council. There were about 19, 20 of these. However, she only generally met about seven or eight of them at a time. She deliberately promoted opposing views so that she could come down on one side or the other and decide for herself. She often used her temper, her fierce temper, to good effect. Um, and she played this cleverly because she was very much associated with one of her leading members of the of the Privy Council, Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, but she never married him. So she was aware of the importance of staying neutral. The other people who were very important were Secretaries of State. Uh, first of all, there was William Cecil, um, then there was Francis Walsingham, and then that was followed, he was followed again by William Cecil once again after his death. Both of them were from the, the, the gentry. They were lawyers, they were very clever, they both died of exhaustion, and they were both willing to do things with Elizabeth that to tell her things that she didn't necessarily want to hear. The reverse side of this and a sign of how Elizabeth's power dwindled towards the end of her reign is with uh, the, uh, the Earl of Essex, who, after a failed attempt to stop a rebellion in Ireland, um, gave his supporters a lot of riches. And then when he was rejected, rejected by the Queen, forced his way into the best chamber um, and was rebuffed by the Queen. And eventually he was stripped of his jobs, leaving him bankrupt. And there you go, there's an example of the patronage not working out for Earl of Essex. When he had very little choice, when he had no money, he rebelled, but it failed again in that support and he was beheaded. So there's an example of the patronage system it, at work, first of all, to lift him up and then secondly, to destroy him. Parliament was very different to the Parliament that we would see today. The MPs weren't elected, but they were chosen by the local lords and by the members of the Privy Council. Uh, it did have a say, it did persuade her to do certain things. For example, towards the end of her reign, Elizabeth was persuaded to uh, end her the, the monopolies that she'd been given to some supporters. Um, she was praised in later time for her use of Parliament because of course the civil war that followed and James and Charles weren't able to get control of Parliament in the same way as Elizabeth was. She had a increasingly rebellious group of, of people, the Puritans. Um, one example is John Stubbs wrote a pamphlet criticising the Queen for her, her proposed marriage to a French Catholic. Of course, you wouldn't like that. Um, and he had his hands cut off along with William Page. There were also protests of people uh, trying to, to get rid of bishops, um, but again, she was able to hold these protests off. But the very fact that there were protests shows that her power was dwindling towards the end of her reign. And there we go. There's your example there of the Puritans trying to get rid, rid of bishops. Three MPs uh, arrested and one Puritan MP um, was sent to the Tower of London and died four years later. 1601, Elizabeth had to give this what's called the golden speech, where basically she said she loved Parliament, she loved her people. Um, she had to acknowledge that she needed to give wider control to more people. Um, the, the speech was widely printed and it's although it was all about her loving her country, it was perhaps another sign of her losing power. So Elizabeth kept power. That was how she kept power in, in Parliament. Around the country, she relied on her uh, powerful noblemen as Lord Lieutenants. She had Justice of the Peace, um, again, came from the well-educated gentry. Um, they were often loyal to her, although we do have some examples of these, some of these being uh, lazy and favouring powerful local families, for example, not taxing as much as they should do. Elizabeth went around the country each year on tours known as progresses. She'd speak to people, she'd stir at noblemen's houses to huge expense they would have to do. And the entertainment was very lavish, as you can see at the bottom there. And often we would cost the, the local lord a huge amount of money. She also continually got power by having these accession day pageants all over the country. There was great bonfires, great celebrating, celebrating the fact that Elizabeth had come to the throne. She used the control, government control of the 60 printing presses to, to censor publications she didn't like, to publish publications against uh, Catholic priests. And to, to publish fable reviews, and you've got the example there, the Fairy Queen, which praised the Queen very much like Elizabeth. Elizabeth herself was a great fan of plays. And if a play was successful, um, and she liked it, it would often appear in the theatres. She did very briefly shut down the theatres um, when they criticised the Queen, although 
plays to criticize the Pope and Philip II of Spain were very much intolerated and allowed, even encouraged, you might say. Uh, pictures were, would have been widespread. Certainly, if you were in the household of Elizabeth, you would be expected to be bearing one of the miniatures of Elizabeth. Um, very carefully used her image to show her power. And we can see there the, the the top image there is one of the Armada. You can see Elizabeth her hand on the globe. We've got the Armada in the background, um, the, 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 the ruff that she's wearing, her, her, her great jewels celebrate her, her wealth. And the bottom one there is the um, rainbow portrait. It, it's not easy for us to recognise, but just here we have Elizabeth holding a rainbow. She's also got what might be termed angel wings around her as well, um, suggesting she's from heaven. This is supposed to be a bread basket, um, which suggests, suggests that she's bringing great food and great um, wealth and happiness to her country. And if you look very carefully on her dress, you can see eyes and even some ears suggesting she sees all and, and, and hears all. And the serpent suggests that she's very um, thoughtful, very, very, very tricky. She's um, very sneaky in what she's able to do as well, Great showing, suggesting that she's got wisdom. When people would go to church, that they would hear this positive message about Elizabeth. Um, every service, the worship, worshippers would say the prayer for the Queen's Majesty. Thanksgivings were held every accession day, and there would be special sermons thanking God for having such a great queen. And that's how she'd really, the church is a vital way of getting over Elizabeth's image. Speaking of the church, of course, it wasn't all easy for Elizabeth. There were the great threats from the Catholics. Uh, this, this was arguably the greatest threat to Elizabeth. So right at the start of, of her reign, she had the Act of Uniformity and the Act of Supremacy, which set out a fairly moderate view that they, people had to worship. They had to use the same common book, common prayer book. They had to worship um, Elizabeth and recognised that she was the supreme head of the church, but it did allow some sort of tolerance. And at the beginning of her reign, there were three million Roman Catholics, um, and most Catholics had completely dropped their faith by 1570 because of these slow changes and because there were fines that came in from not going to church. By the 1580s, we've got a slightly different situation. Most ch uh, Roman Catholics were conformers. Um, we had millions of Catholics who were church papists, that is, that they would particularly um, in the north and the west, that they would go to church. Um, they stayed loyal to the Pope, but did nothing to challenge the Queen. Um, but now, by the 1580s, we've got these recusants who refused to attend Protestant services, arranged their own services, and this is very much seen as a threat to Elizabeth. And we've got a very small number who were plotters, refused to attend the Catholic Protestant church and actively opposed, but it is worth bearing in mind that they were a very small number. Now, the issue here is, is that as the threat from Spain grew and the possibilities of our Spanish Armada grew, then that threat increases. It all increased from 1570 when Pope Pius V excommunicated Elizabeth and freed English Catholics from supporting their queen. It wouldn't have meant much to many Catholics, but this meant something to some Catholics people like Francis Tresham started to refuse to go to church, started to display the Catholicism. So what did Elizabeth do about this? Well, here's the issue. Did they overreact? Well, 1581 Act of Persuasions increased the fine by about 10,000% to £20 per month, which is the, about the income of most landowning gentry farms. So it became extremely expensive. So this was reserved mainly for the very rich, the, the recusants, and non-fine payers could be imprisoned. The threat was was really increased over this time period, as I said, of this threat from the Spanish Armada. So we get an act against priests given death penalty. We have the Recusancy Act, uh, where they could take two thirds of the land who anyone who hadn't paid their fines. The horrible example of Margaret Clitheroe, who was tortured to death through pressing, as you can see in that bottom image, uh, sorry, the top image there. Uh, most influential Catholics were arrested as that threat increased in 1588 with the Spanish Armada. And then in 1593, they even restricted Catholics. There was still a threat of another Armada at that point, so which partly explains why that was the case. Now, the threat really was ramped up by foreign issues. So priests 
who didn't accept Elizabeth's Protestant church, left, had left the country, but from 1570 started returning. Two different types of priests, so many priests um, gave secret services, but they didn't try and convert the Protestants. The Jesuit priests, much more direct loyalty to the Pope, and were trying to deepen Catholicism and convert everyone to Catholicism. Uh, we've got Robert Persons and Edmund Campion, who, at the latter of which, was hung, drawn and quartered, despite his declaring loyalty to the Queen. Over 100 new priests arrived from 1580, travelling in disguise, often hiding in priest holds. Elizabeth used Justice of the Peace to check them out, but one of the most reliable ways was through her Walsingham's network of spies, um, people such as Anthony Munday, Charles Sled and George Eliot, used to detect these priests. And you can see there, bottom left hand corner, one of these priest holes in action, tiny little space where the priests were hiding. Now, after the execution of Edmund, Ed, Edward Campion, Catholics started using propaganda to suggest showing awful images of the of the, the hung, drawn and quartering, um, criticising Elizabeth and her torturer Richard Topcliffe. The government responded to its own counter propaganda, giving its own views and explained why it acted. And we mentioned this before, but the act against priests in 1585 is followed up by asking priests what's known as the bloody question which asks them if, if, they, if, they, if there was an invasion of a foreign power, would they be loyal to Elizabeth? If they were, they'd lose credibility as a priest, or would they be loyal to the Pope, in which case they were a traitor? A second threat, Mary Queen of Scots had fled to England because she was unwelcome in Scotland. They'd been, she'd been uh, ousted from power in Scotland. Elizabeth looked after her because she was a cousin, um, and she was held in England, but the very existence of Mary really did create a, a tangible threat to Elizabeth um, and she was placed under surveillance. Uh, first of all, she was implied in the failed Throckmorton plot, which had no direct link, but then brought about this bond of association, which said that even if there was no evidence that Mary knew about the plot, she could still be executed. And this brought her downfall with the Babington plot in 1586. Uh, letters were sent to Mary hidden in beer barrels, it was discovered by a spy. They broke the codes. Um, Elizabeth put Mary on trial. Mary put up a very strong defence saying she'd got no right to be put on trial and that the only evidence that linked her what had been had been drawn from uh, from people under torture and therefore wasn't reliable. However, Elizabeth reluctantly signed the warrant and Mary was executed. Elizabeth claimed that she didn't want the the execution to happen she tried to withdraw order um, and she was furious with Cecil for allowing it to be sent. We do probably think that she didn't know what she was doing um, and it was just a way of her trying to distance herself and say she was unhappy with what had occurred. We have lots of foreign threats during this time. Um, this really is the crux of the whole Catholic argument. If there had been no foreign threats, who knows? Of course, Mary's Elizabeth's sister Mary had married Philip of Spain um, Elizabeth herself had turned down Philip and then a number of different things happen. We get uh, Drake and Hawkins and other English captains attacking Spanish ships for their gold. We get Elizabeth sending aid to the rebel Dutch Protestants fighting against the Spanish. You can understand why Philip was so angry about this. Um, as the threat builds, it seems like Elizabeth panicked. Um, 2,000 English troops were sent to fight the Spanish in 1585. Um, 1587, Drake raided Cadiz, known as the Sinjin, the King of Spain's beard, because he wrecked the Armada plans that were underway at the time. The execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, really did push Philip. And in 1588, the Armada set sail for England. I'm not surprised when the government set up its campaign. JPs arrested more accusants like Tresham, um, more, more priests, and you can see this steep spike in the amount of executions that occur in this time around the Spanish Armada. So that's the key thing for you to mention if you get this as a as a key exam question. More priests were executed in this time than any other period as the threat from Spain grew. However, by 1603, almost all Catholics had given up their faith um, or attending Protestant church services without complaint. Philip of Spain died in 1598 and his son Philip III was a much weaker leader. Mary Queen of, got to, Queen of Scots had gone, there was no one to replace Elizabeth. Um, and by the end of her reign, with all these measures in place, only about 40,000 Catholics were left in place. Okay, section three, daily lives. 
Well, there are probably less differences between the people in Elizabethan times than we might have expected, and um, certainly than used to be thought of as the case. Um, men mostly got married in the late 20s and women in the mid, mid, in the mid 20s, um, just like today. It was only really the gentry who had the extra money and therefore could get could afford to get married younger. Sex outside of marriage was forbidden by the church as it was sinful, but we do know that up to 30% of Elizabethan brides were pregnant when they were married, whether they got um, married when they found they were pregnant or perhaps more likely once they decided they were going to get married, then they, they started having sex. We, we don't know. Um, Elizabethans didn't approve of men or women who were overly violent or overly scolding and divorce was very, very rare, of course. Um, but there were broken families because often because of the death of a, a husband or wife. We used to think that there, that there wasn't a great relationship between uh, Elizabethans and their children because the children often died so, so young. There you go, 25% of the children died before the age of 10. But actually, recent research has suggested the opposite, that actually there was a strong bond between them. Um, certainly in poor houses, they would be, um, children would be expected from the age of seven to go to, to send their kids to school. Um, I, but the poorest houses from the age of 13, most boys would leave home to go and work as servants or apprentices and girls also work in servants. And in fact, we know that up to a third of houses contain young people working as servants. And they stay there from their early teens until they married, um, often well away from the, the family home. Um, beating was common in grammar schools, but there's actually little evidence of, of cruelty towards children was any more widespread than it is today. It happened, but we shouldn't get run away from the idea that it was a common thing. Um, in terms of wider family, actually, because the children were often sent away and didn't live in the same area necessarily, um, often um, people had more, more contact and more of a relationship with their neighbours. Um, we've got evidence of if they, if they had a problem or debt problem, they would more like to seek help from a neighbour than from a relative. Right now we divide it into the, the, the different phases, um, the different levels of Elizabethan society. So higher status, apart from nobility, um, is the gentry, only 2% of the population, great variety in the different ranks. You can see their Duke Earl um, right down to minor gentlemen. Um, their own land ownership or the political power, often as justices of the peace. Um, they lived in great big houses, an example there of Montague House in uh, at the bottom of the page there. 20 to 50 rooms was an uncommon tall decorated chamber ch uh, chimneys, coats of arms. There was a, would be a great hall where they would, visitors would wait to see the family. Uh, and then there was all this ceremony, the great chamber with magnificent feasts, um, often with music, dancing, plays, um, and, and masks were used as well. There was the best chamber, which is probably the image that we have mostly of Elizabethans, this rich, decorative uh, four-poster bed, feather mattresses, pillows and sheets, uh, lots of different service rooms um, might take up one end of a house or one part of a, of a, of a block and there would be extensive landscape gardens which again were another opportunity to show off. Their food was, was great, greatly in, in variety, um, often coming from the, the estates and from the gardens. Uh, lots of different meats you can see there at the top, including birds and including fish. Huge cost would be would be spent on this. And then again, this ceremony, up to 20 servants, long procession. They'd be bringing the meal on the silver and the pewter platters. Um, start in late morning, could it take up to a couple of hours? And unlike any of the other classes, uh, fine wine from France or Germany would be drunk. And the banquet would often be followed with a sweet course, which would be sugar and marzipan confections. So a, a real ceremonial feasting experience. Now the middling sorts, we, we got, again, we got a great variety here. We got the yeoman who would sort of be middle manager far farmers. They, they'd own up to 50 acres or more um, and would employ farm labourers. Um, they often be church wardens or, or they'd work um, as overseers of the poor and then less less wealthy husbandmen um, who often farm their own land. It wouldn't be uncommon for them to have um, 
one or two female servants, but actually a lot of the work would still be undertaken by the yeoman's wife. So middling houses wouldn't be unlike a lot of the houses actually you see around Ludlow. Be, there'd be a major chimney, there'd be glazed uh, windows. Um, and we know from probate inventories um, that there would be again a hall, a much, obviously a much smaller version than the, the one we saw for the upper classes for the gentry, um, providing a fire which could be cooked upon. His family would eat at a long table, wooden benches and chairs. The parlour was the major bedroom and living and sleeping room with the feather mattress belonging to the yeoman and his wife. And then there'd be other chambers for the children and the other servants, and there might be separate service rooms uh, as well, including a brew house, a bake house, a dairy, uh, and a kitchen. Food would be, there's, there's still some variety here. We've got a variety of meats you can see, um, but they, they'd serve their own food. The servants would join them at the table, so very different to the gentry. Uh, best white flour be saved for cakes and pastries, and that would be when guests were there. Normally they'd have uh, yeoman bread with some of the bran left in, so a cheaper version. They get uh, fruit and vegetables from their gardens and from the orchards. They drink mead and beer, but they wouldn't be affording wine because it was very expensive. It'd be for gentry only. Right on to the labouring poor. So about half the population, perhaps even more, but we we know very little about their lives because there's no written information about them. Most lives in the countryside. Not many had permanent jobs and would travel from farm to farm, desperately seeking a job that would keep them alive. Um, only two thirds had their own cottages and garden plots. Um, after a rather cruel act of 1589, stopped them building on common land unless they could show that they owned four acres of land. The houses would be small, they would be dark, there'd be no upper rooms. You might only have two rooms, there'd be no glass. Um, the smoke would have escaped through the hatch, um, a, a space at the top, at the top of the roof. Um, very bare earth floor, there'd be hardly anything in the hall apart from the table, a bench um, and the sleeping room, if there was a separate one, would only contain a, a wooden bed with a mattress filled with straw, so much less comfortable um, than the middling sorts. Food again, we're talking basic, we're talking bread, um, we're talking a, a basic bread as well from rye or barley because they couldn't afford the, the wheat. Partage is like a, a, a thick soup or a um, yeah, a, a sort of combination of various different vegetables and, and, and some meats um, during good times, maybe eggs and cheese and fish and bacon, um, and they dip in. And th this might be replenished every now and again. It, it might be from this we get our, our phrase pot luck in that you'd dip a spoon in and you didn't know whether you're going to get some meat or you get some vegetables or you might not. With In common with the others, they would also have beer. Um, but the key thing here to remember is, is that when there were poor harvests, you can see that there were in 1594. 1995 and 1596 and as the grain prices increased many labour and poor would simply have starved to death. And that brings us nicely on to the issue of poverty. Uh, up until the, the 16th century there'd always been a proportion of population um, falling into, into poverty but this certainly increased at this time. Uh, settled poor made up about 30% of the urban population, many of them had been children. The vagrant poor, those who moved from place to place, wandered looking for work, were often young, unmarried men and women, travelling alone or in twos and threes, and they'd be greeted with great suspicion by villagers who didn't recognise them. They would move them on, they'd let the local constable know, and a lot of them would die in barns and hedgerows during the, the cold winter months. So what caused this? The population had increased, it had, it had almost doubled. Um, from in, in the 80 years up to the period that we're looking at, English agriculture what just wasn't coping, so there was a steady increase in the rising prices. Um, failed harvests, we already mentioned that. Woolen cloth was in a mess as well, uh, so th th there was inconsistency with jobs. There was outbreaks of plague, um, which killed people uh, and in in again increased the misery. And then we get famine from 1597 to 59, leading to huge rates uh, increases in the death rate as as highlighted here in this graph look at that spike just there so great poverty uh during these times um we're looking at so the the period we're looking we we're looking at is from about this period so when people talk about elizabeth's reign and the difficulties of face we've got to remember that we have got those issues there with uh wheat prices in increasing at the same time as we've got these 
failed harvests that we're looking at just here as well. So the government divide, divided the sets into three different sets of people. And I suppose we do a similar thing our, ourselves, but we don't officially do it. There's the impotent, impotent poor, so the sick and the physically unable, including the elderly. We've got the elderly body poor who wanted work but couldn't find it. And then we get vagabonds, uh, effectively a crime, this, um, who were people who chose not to work. How did the government deal with this? Well, they didn't do much for the first two, but they did try to be harsh and punish um, the vagabonds. So from 17, 1572, sorry, uh, anyone over the age of 14 can be whipped and a hole through the other size of a penny um, would be burnt. And if you were found to repeat that, you, you would be hanged. Um, and increasingly, because it's seen as a crime, anyone who offers shelter to vagrants could also be fined. So you can imagine wandering from place to place with those sort of markings on you. Um, and you would again would be seen in great fear, but very difficult to get work. I think once you've been pronounced as a vag vagabond and you've been you've got that that burn in your ear, um, very difficult. As I said, the government did do much for the other two. They left it mostly to the towns, but we do know some towns took action on this. One example of York in 1588, gentry and middling sort were taxed. They, they worked at their, their income. They, they had to pay a poor rate. Um, there was viewers who were appointed who made a list of all the different poor and the, the various different levels. Again, lame, impotent and past work got three happens. They, those who could give, who could work and would work, um, were given a small wage to, to spin in their own homes. And then rogues, vagabonds, strange beggars, that's beggars that they don't know, were put to work in houses of correction, pretty much prisons and banished from the cities. And we know that this was common in many cities um, around this time. And the, just to point out these, this is this is uh, from a book at the time uh, and the sort of hysteria is creating about these vagabonds and faking it, uh, pretending that they're, they're, they can't work. And again, seeing poverty as a crime. Now, there would have been people who did that, but the vast majority, I'm sure, were desperate for work to earn some money to to stop them from dying. So the Elizabethan. Poor law came in right at the end of the Elizabethan period and pretty much took the system idea from from places such as York. So just as the peace supported four overseers of the poor with church wardens, they collect the poor rate, the tax um, begging was was banned. Impotent poor were looked after in almshouses and works provided for the able bodies. And if you didn't work or you refused to work, you go to jail or a house of correction for hard labour. So it didn't end poverty, but it. it when there were really harsh harv harvests, it gave a, a chance for people to survive. And for the first time, really, this poor law was given responsibility for the poor in the hands of the government, albeit that it paid through local taxation. And it does stay this until the until the Victorian period or just before the Victorian period uh, in 1834. Section four, uh, popular culture. What was the truth about happiness in Elizabethan England? Well, first of all, we know this was a time of, of great culture. And again, this idea, this interpretation, of course, of, of a golden age. Now, standing head and shoulders above everyone else is William Shakespeare, um, who certainly is the reason why many people see this as a golden period. Um, still studied in, in, in schools up and down Britain and indeed all over the world. But there was some steps forward in terms of art. Nicholas Hilliard stands out uh, as, uh, as a genius, but most of the other artists are fairly, were fairly mediocre. And even here, he had got his ideas from the French court. Music was popular. The Queen liked, particularly liked it. Talis and Bird, church music. We got Dowland with, uh, with non-religious uh, secular airs. So that's accompanied by a lute. And they did take English music to, to new heights. But of course, it's literature, which is the biggest one. We've got the printing press being created during this time uh, and becoming more popular. Sydney Spencer, uh, Sydney and Spencer, Hackleite and Camden, um, great travel books and biographies. And again, Shakespeare dominating the, this period. Now, what we do see during this time period is a decline in popular pastimes and festivities. Um, they still existed, but they start dying out. Um, and certainly they continue, continue to die out into the early part of the 17th century. Um, 
May games, plays and Morris dancing disappeared. So calendar customs, Christmas was a great time of feasting, similar sort of drinking and feasting at May Day um, with Maypoles, Midsummer's Eve saw bonfires, drinking again, common theme here, and Harvest Home, the end of the farming year, feast dancing and drinking, lots of drinking in there. Uh, the sports were often very violent, bare knuckle boxing, again, often drink associated with these. There's bear baiting, bull baiting, badger baiting, all sorts of horrific things as we'd see it now. And coming back to beer again, increase in the, in the in number of, uh, of ale houses um, after 1588 were seen as a place of, of drunkenness, gambling and prostitution. So what happened to this? Well, in short, one word, Puritans. Uh, they see they see it, it vital. A lot of these things took place on a Sunday and they saw Sunday as a time to to to, to pray and to be restful. Um, they, they saw a lot of the the, 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 the activities, the festivities as pagan practices. And that was true. We still have pagan practices as part of our Christmases today, taking away from what they wanted to be the Christian message. Um, and they didn't see them as appropriate. And of course, the sex, the drinking, the celebrating, the debauchery, the, the losing of control, the chaos was something, and, and sex outside marriage, was seen as something which the Puritans certainly disapproved of. The, the similar sort of time for this really is we, we've got a, an increase in the amount of people who are accused of being witches. Um, magic wasn't, at the beginning of this period, magic was an alternative. It was something to, to religion. It was something that most Elizabethans would have accepted. And they'd use, see magic as, an, as, a, as a, a reason behind something going wrong, something going right. Wise women were seen genuinely, not just as, as we might see them, as people use herbs and knowing their, 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 their way around different medicines, but they would be seen as, as magic. And it, it was a good chance that many of the witches themselves saw themselves as magic. Um, witchcraft was seen as a very negative thing in, in, in Europe, um, not quite as much so in Elizabethan England, um, but they were seen as, as having small animals and imps and familiars um, which were used to uh, commit these evil acts. So there we go, we got the, the huge amount increase in, in witchcraft uh, over this period. So we're again, we're looking at this sort of period here. This is the, 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 the period that we're focusing on. So we can see those witchcraft persecutions, they go up from 109, 1580 to 166 and 128. So we got, we got, we got quite a lot of persecutions of witches uh, during this time period. And it, you know, if you compare that to these lower periods here, um, at Elizabeth and before the period we're looking at near this steep climb in those charts. Now it's difficult for us to work out why that was because from 1563 there'd been a, a law about witchcraft and that you could be hanged um, in prison to, if you killed anything through witchcraft. Um, but we've only got records from the southeast um, and from the county of Cheshire. But as I say there was a great increase in the amount of people accused of being witches during this time period. Um, it also ties in with a, tie, with, a, with a period when there was a huge rise in population and in poverty and maybe those poor harvests that created tension and that leads to the increase in the amount of uh, accusations. Several interpretations why it might be. Uh, and I, For me, there's a combination here. Um, 1970s, the theory was, was because it was a hard time of living. And if we look at this, this graph here, uh, this shows the, the, the harvests um, and whether there was enough food around. And we can see during this time period, there certainly was a great struggle at the time, same time as the increase happens in the amount of accusations about women being accused of being witches. Of course, theory number two there, 1990s feminist historians uh, point out that it is women who are being attacked. And that's certainly true. And I certainly th think there's some misogyny going on there. Although it would, it were useful to point out that it was often women who accused women of, of doing this, but then it was magistrates and the jurors who judged them were men. And then the third one, we got the Puritans back in the game again. Um, if we look at the witch trials here, uh, Hertfordshire, a heavy populated area, um, 
and Sussex, another large county, not great amounts of which was Essex, where there were very many Puritan ministers trying to establish godly communities, a much higher figure there. So there is some potential association between where Puritans were and the amount of witch trials that occurred. And that, that seems to make sense. It's worth noting that a lot of the trials didn't come from the government or the church. It actually started off as a complaint from a neighbour. Normally there's a quarrel, something's mumbled or something is cursed, and then something goes wrong and people are accused of being witches. And as I said before, it's possible that many of the accused actually did believe themselves to, to be witches. Right, we're going to have the, the Puritans come into this area as well. The, this is a great time period tying in with William Shakespeare, of course, but not just not exclusively William Shakespeare, where we do have these new Elizabethan uh, theatres. Now, there had been previously been plays known as miracle plays um, or just miracles or mysteries, um, and they've been banned by Elizabeth's Privy Council because they were seen as being Catholic. So we get a tie in there. Then 1576, a new building just performing plays uh, was created outside the city walls and it was called simply the theater so these theaters where well, you can see um we get a great rise so we get the theater in 1576 then the curtain the rose the swan and in 1599 the globe of william shakespeare thousands of london's londoners were visited these from lots of different social groups they loved the interaction of it. Theatres were very different to our experience today. You had bustling places, people moving around, people selling things. Uh, you could people felt part of the play. They'd interact with the the actors on stage. Drownings paid a penny um, to do at the bottom and stand amongst the filth there. Um, and the extra penny could get a seat in one of the covered galleries. So if you got a forward, you could do that. But a lot of people just enjoyed the atmosphere. As I say, noisy affairs. People chatted. People booed through dull bits lots of eating drinking there was lots of interaction and people use this as an excuse to go and visit um take part in other activities like bear baiting or bull baiting um or they go to the alehouses gambling then the brothels um the queen certainly loved the going to the theater um and ignored many of the complaints that came away only shutting them during the plagues of 1588 81 and 82 and then you can see again 1582 to 3 and 1603 what would those who criticised the theatres say? Well, there were certainly fights, there was pickpockets. Uh, the, the, the mayor and the alderman didn't like the fact that they built outside the city walls so that they, they had no influence of them. Um, they did help the spread of disease, but that's, not, that's really just because lots of people are gathering there. And here we go, the Puritans again, they associate them with paganism, the miracle plays are Catholic and they didn't like, and of course the sinful behaviour was a no-no for many Puritans. So our final section, uh, Elizabethan adventurers. So it's worth just saying right at the start, this is a classic area for interpretation. Because the, uh, th these adventurers were admired and seen as great exploring um, and great, just great novelty at the time, they had a great legacy that they inspired later explorers, and that's why they probably got a more positive view than what they did. They they went exploring, they 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 went into new territories. How successful we are, they were, we'll see in just a moment. So, so Walter Raleigh is probably the one of the most famous ones, but and then you can see him pictured on this uh, on on this advert here. Um, but of course, he wasn't even there, and that's an example of the he didn't go on even go on that that voyage because Elizabeth and Land sail the Atlantic himself. Um, so he wasn't even there, but it's that image that stays on. Now, large part of this came of it because the Spanish were so successful at it and the Portuguese were so successful at it. And you can see the Spanish empire there on the left-hand side. You know, right, Britain hadn't got anything to rival that. John Dee, Dr. John Dee, wanted to change all that. He coined the phrase of a British empire uh, and he persuaded the queen that something needed to be done about this. So let's go through these, some of these adventures. So Francis Drake, a huge, amazing journey around the world, as you can see in that map on the middle right there, in his ship, the Golden Hind, first Englishman ever to enter the Pacific Ocean. Uh, he only the second ever sailor to sail around the world. Um, he, he 
plundered as Francis Drake is wont was, was to do so. Uh, Tax gold chips, plunder the coast of Chile and Peru, claimed California, calling it New Albion, Albion the old word for England, uh, for Queen Elizabeth. And then he fled, basically, fearing uh, the Spanish would attack back. He fled um, through the Spice Islands, then via South Africa, modern day South Africa, via the good, Cape of Good Hope, knighted on board the Golden Hind, um, causing fury for the Spanish king. Uh, who saw him as very little more than a pirate. So an amazing journey, um, claimed lots of gold for himself, gave lots of gold to Elizabeth, didn't really achieve anything long lasting apart from the legacy of other people who wanted to copy him. So Humphrey Gilbert uh, really had ambitions to rival Spain, as a lot of these explorers do, um, presented a, a, a speech, a book, on why he should go and do it. And that was partly to annoy the, the King of Spain. Um, once established a trade route, uh, failed in 1579 on one voyage, then he claimed Newfoundland in 1583. Um, although it has to be said, other people had already claimed uh, this area too. Poor, horrible conditions, cold conditions, barren conditions. After many deaths, sailors demanded to go home. Uh, Gilbert overloaded a ship and it sank um, in 1583 and Gilbert drowned. Did he achieve an awful lot when he claimed Newfoundland, but nothing long lasting was established apart from the legacy of others wanting to repeat it. So Walter Raleigh, uh, the most, arguably the most famous along with Drake, uh, he had explored North America, again trying to find gold for himself and wanted to go to Asia, so he was trying to find a new route towards Asia, thought that route via North America would do so. Uh, he, he discovered the island of Ranoki, um, and made contact with Native American people, uh, petitioned the Queen, said all the right things, that it would be, it should be about spreading the word of God, that there'd be new products there, that there were possibilities of new markets, um, and that there was a possibility of attacking Spanish treasure ships as well. Now, the Queen agreed to it, but actually it wasn't him who led the second voyage, it was his cousin Richard Grenville, who himself was later replaced by Ralph Lane as governor. Uh, harsh winter conflicts with the Native Americans led to all-out war, uh, and really they had to be rescued in the end. However, the, the important bit here is that scientists Thomas Harriet and artist John White formed a, 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 a write-up on this, a document on this brief and true report of Newfoundland of, of Virginia, named after Queen Elizabeth as a virgin queen. Um, and provided knowledge to later allow the first ever successful colony at Jamestown um, in Virginia. So there's not really an awful lot of trading going on here, there's not an awful lot of gold going on, there's a lot of, of exploring and trying things and inspiring people for later on, but not an awful lot of success. Raleigh was also involved in searching for the fabled city of Manoa, which is probably more famous by its Spanish name of El Dorado, um, in Guinea, South America. Went there, explored, didn't find the expected gold, but his, again, we've got another book here, 1596, Discovery of the Large, Rich and Beautiful Empire of Guyana, meant that there was many, many, many more people inspired to empire, by an empire building, and this would continue into the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, those were mostly involved with explorations to the west, although albeit that they were hoping to link it through to the east, obviously the, 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 the geography of America wasn't fully understood. Now the trade with the east, the English had learned from what the Spanish and especially the Portuguese had done, that there was a lot of worth in, in exploring East Asia. Portugal had forts and trading posts, Spain then invaded Portugal in 1580, meaning that the British felt that their own trade um, with India would be disrupted. Um, so we, we now get trade links with the Ottoman Empire, which is modern day Turkey, and they formed the Turkey Company in 1581, which was hoping to link up overland, partly overland via the Mediterranean, uh, with India. Ralph Fitch was one of the first Englishmen to go and explore this. He and four others, uh, commissioned by the Turkey Company to, to look for opportunities for trade in this area and potentially with China as well. And this is how, how little they understood about the world. They hoped that letters from the Queen Elizabeth would protect them. And of course, people 
further away had never heard of, of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, they left in 1583, went to Syria through Baghdad, over through the Persian Gulf to the Portuguese trading post of Hormuz. There, their letters didn't do them much good. They were arrested as spies, they took off the Indian Ocean to Goa, um, and they then began the journey to the court of the Mughal Empire, Akbar, in northern India. Absolutely astonished by the, the cloth, the peppers, the spices, the size of the diamonds, in, including the, the emperor's new palace at Fatapur Sikri, um, which is near Agra. Then he went to the Himalayas, he became the first Englishman to travel through Burma, in through the Malay Peninsula, hearing about the sea trade between China and the, uh, and the, and the Spice Islands before being halted by those dastardly Portuguese. Right back home, uh, eight years later in 1591, again, we got a book here, wrote a account of his journey, inspired many others, talked about the people, the customs, the religions, uh, and inspired many merchants to go and explore this area. So again, we, he, he brought back some wealth, but we're not talking about well-established wealth. We're, we're talking about large and the inspiration for people to go and do this in the future. Now, this is where we have potentially some actual real change here. James Lancaster, East India Company. Uh, he was a veteran of the Spanish Armada, failed to begin with going towards the East. But in 1600, he commanded the expedition of the new East India Company, uh, establishing England's first factory or warehouse, uh, Bantam uh, in Java in 1602. So right at the end of Elizabethan period here. Um, and now we finally get this increase in trade, spices returned back to England. But, but when he did return, Elizabeth had already been dead for six months. No colony in, in America or Northwest Passage to, to the East. Um, but in the following 100, 200 years, the East India Company opened many more factories on the coast of India. And by the 18th century, it ruled India um, and became the biggest trading company the world had ever known. So didn't achieve an awful lot in its time. It was right at the end of the Elizabethan period, but inspired things for the future. And that's where part of his legacy comes from, this belief that the Elizabethans were great explorers. So one final last look at that mark scheme. Remember, this paper is largely about interpretations. We can see that with A, we have to describe from mind to that B is you have to use your own knowledge. B, uh, question seven, asks you to, to compare two or three sources. You've got to explain what they say, how they differ, and crucially for the highest marks, why they differ. And then we get these major questions at the end, questions eight or nine, where you really have to really carefully plan. You've got a two-sided argument and then a clever conclusion. Probably why you start off with a very short introduction, setting out your, your, the arguments to begin with. Planning for that is absolutely key. And here we have some examples of, of what sort of uh, things you can do on each one. Question 6a obviously depends on what the, the, the source is. Um, question 6b, as I said, a lot of your own knowledge needs to be coming into play. So you need to be thinking what's missing, how, what sort of things should I, should I be researching here? So you need to use your own knowledge. Question 7, you've got an example of how the diff each what each of the different sources say and then thinking about what type of source it is who wrote it when they wrote it what they were writing it for are they giving a generalized view are they giving talking about a very specific part do they do they are they fully useful um about the the power of elizabeth or whatever the question is and then we've got the model answers here to to finish off with and then finally you've got question eight or nine and you can see it's knowledge it's about the shown as an interpretation. It's about showing your second order skills. Now that basically means complexity, showing the complexity. It's not as, it's not as simple as yes or no. Um, well substanti substantiated judgment to finish off. And there, finally, another example, um, this time for question nine. Please let us know if you have any questions about this. We can't um, we can't help you unless you say so. Hopefully you found this useful. It should be at least useful for you to be thinking, what do I not know? What do I not understand or what do I need to explore further?